no, actually we're, we're getting that in the indoors. And I wonder, you know, how much our bad indoor air quality practices, especially pathogens and things that are airborne, what can we do to prevent uh, retransmission and in things indoors? Hello, welcome to People, Planet, Profit, a podcast by Earth Up, where we aim to help businesses and people like you simplify sustainability. EarthUp's CEO, Stephen Bay, will be joined by experts, innovators, and lifelong adventurers to break down some of today's biggest topics affecting the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profits. What does a sick building do to your health? Why should corporations be invested in biodiversity? How can I help create better working conditions and happier employees at my company? We'll cover these questions and so much more in a candid conversation about reshaping work culture into a landscape that prioritizes people and planet without sacrificing profit. Our next episode starts right now. Hey everyone, Stephen Bay here, CEO of EarthUp. Today we have the pleasure of chatting with Dean Young, who is the head of product at AWARE. AWARE's mission is to empower people to breathe safely indoors wherever they go. They've created an industry-leading indoor air quality platform that enables consumers and enterprise clients to monitor indoor air quality. How are you doing today, Dean? Welcome to the Hi, show. Hi, Stephen. Thanks so much. Yeah, pleasure to be here. Let's just jump right into it and talk about indoor air quality. Tell us how you got to be head of product of AWARE. You know, what's your passion lies when it comes to air quality and why you chose this route? Uh, I've always been passionate about the environment and sustainability, you know, studying it in college. I've been involved in uh, small company startups pretty much entire career. So when I had an opportunity to work at a hardware plus software company, uh, AWARE, in the indoor environment, you know, it's very easy to take this sort of outdoor passions and learnings, apply it to indoor space, how we automate and mitigate for various indoor air quality issues. When you first started at AWARE, were you aware of all the issues inside indoor air quality or did you kind of drive up the adoption curve once you were working with the team? I think I was probably uh, aware of like only a few things, to be honest. It was absolutely eye-opening to be exposed to all the different environmental factors. And there's just so much that goes on in indoor space. There's a new marketing campaign calling us the indoor generation, but the majority of the awareness is around outdoor air issues. What have you learned around indoor air quality when it comes to office spaces and productivity and just overall health for individuals? For the built environment and the days where we were in the office a lot, it's a typical story. Maybe you get tired in the afternoon and you're like, oh, I got to I gotta have that uh, caffeine or something to, to wake up and to come and learn, oh, actually it might be a building that's affecting you know my ability to perform at my job this isn't me this is my environment is is just crazy and like you said around productivity and how you can feel tired something that was astonishing to me is how much noise actually does that what are the things that is aware is doing to really innovate around the space to really trying to understand what are all the common issues inside indoor environments how to identify them and then how to mitigate them and there's really a lot more once you get into building standards and like ASHRAE recommendations or, you know, what scientists are saying about virus transmission and, and all these sort of things. But the other air factors such as carbon dioxide building up, you know, making you feel groggy at some levels, like leading to similar effects as alcohol intoxication. You know, it's like, would, would you be drunk at work? Like, that's a terrible concept. But, you know, your building might be doing that to you. Another factor that gets a lot of attention nowadays is volatile organic compounds, uh, VOCs, and, uh, you know, the off-gassing from various building products, uh, textiles, you know, treat, treating those, and, you know, sick building syndrome is, is uh, kind of born out of those accumulating in these indoor spaces and long-term exposure. Particulate matter is pretty nasty stuff. Uh, you know, it's uh, small enough to penetrate through your lungs, uh, you know, barriers there, and and get into your bloodstream and you know, has been linked to a lot of long-term health effects. A lot of these pollutants and contaminants and things, you get long-term low uh, levels of exposure and builds up, accumulates in, in your system. It's not all doom and gloom. I mean, there are plenty of things that you can do to, to uh, combat them, you know, filtration, ventilation, just sourcing the right materials and, and things like that. But as you mentioned too, you know, there, there are other things that affect our performance, like uh, light and noise. Um, you know, a lot of new research around circadian rhythms and 
you know, do we have the right wavelength of light uh, supplied in the building or enough uh, natural light sources or, and then noise, you know, not just a concentration thing, but just the ambient levels, not so much like the peaks and the, the valleys, but what is that average over time looking like? And does that sort of like wear down on you? And like you said, it's not all doom and gloom. Once you're aware and you actually know where it's coming from, some of these problems are really easy to solve. And these problems, by solving them, companies will see increased productivity inside office spaces, happiness, health concerns, all those things are kind of reduced. You mentioned particular matter, and some of the sources of particular matter aren't just fires out, outdoors, but it's combusting appliances indoors. What have you kind of learned the sources of a number of these different things as you've been working with uh, Aware for the last little while? Certainly some things are, are uh, specific to like your home environment. Some are only found in offices. There's some pretty nasty VOCs and like the large ink cartridges you might have in an office uh, printer. How many people know that? Or, you know, maybe your seat, your, maybe your desk is near the, that big industrial printer. In the home space, you get a sense of it when your, your smoke detector goes off from burning something on the stove. If you've ever looked at the particulate matter counts before it gets to that point, they're already astronomically high and you're only being alerted once it's gotten like so thick and, and on the ceiling. It can be quite surprising what those levels are day to day. You know, that's primarily what we spent our time around is, is building awareness and giving them access to data. Something companies are focusing more and more on is the triple bottom line. But the other thing that's happened is people are working in their homes more and more. Historically, companies have offices and campuses that they focus on. The ventilation, the layout, they're building managers that make sure employees that are spending 8, 10, 12 hours a day are in healthy environments. There are no building managers inside people's homes. How do you see companies helping boost productivity and health in a work from home world? Not everywhere is going to go completely 100% remote. So, you know, on that side, we see the these reentry conversations and uh, folks, you know, wanting to strategize around like, how are we getting enough ventilation and what factors should we be measuring and what should we be optimizing, you know, those building teams and things. But if employees are spending less time at the office and, and quite a bit more even, you know, sharing time between both, then you got to wonder, like, maybe you, you take that investment that's traditionally been spent on the built environment, you know, at the office, and maybe redirect that to making your employees uh, a little happier and healthy at home. So there's a lot of opportunity to, you know, on both sides to, in, in both types of workplaces to, optimize indoor space. You talked about sick building syndrome and just a little bit of history on that. That came from the energy crisis in the 70s. They started making building codes tighter and tighter so that they'd be more energy efficient. But what they didn't see when they were doing that was the fact that they're actually closing in a lot of the issues inside our homes. So with so many people working outside the traditional office space now, whether they're full-time or partial, you're saying that there's a lot of benefit and area of opportunity for employers to help their employees become more aware of air quality and other building health concerns and to help mitigate those negative effects on productivity, happiness, and health. Nobody wants to be sick, unhappy, or uncomfortable while working. And employers can provide resources for their own remote workers similar to what they have provided in traditional workspaces. They're are really easy things, I gotta tell you, that you, you can do to, to help fix some of these things. My building, for example, I currently live in small San Francisco apartments. We, we build up CO2 pretty quickly here. Building built in 2016, as you said, like very tight building envelope. So one thing I just came to realize is that the, the CO2 just had nowhere to escape. And being on the top floor too, again, that stack effect and like the pressure building up on the top, had to let that out. Fortunately, here in California, we have pretty temperate environment, so it can leave the windows open. But oftentimes that wasn't enough. Uh, we actually leave a box fan in the window, just going you know, as, as much as we can. And uh, it helps particularly like uh, when cooking, the range hood might not be strong enough a lot of times. So again, you, you know, if you've got uh, gas-fired stoves or, or uh, oven, uh, things like that, then it's got to go somewhere. And, and if it's not going out through the vent, then you're going to have to find another way. I really want to hone on the fact that it's like very easy to uh, mitigate these things, and you have no idea unless you're actually measuring it.
So CO2, you open windows, VOCs, what are some of the some of the quick tips that you would give listeners around how to reduce their VOCs in their home? Ventilating, if that's not possible, you're trying to go into the source. So eliminating some of those uh, VOC cleaning supplies. I think there are plenty of great alternatives. Figuring out like where, where does your furniture come from and even buying uh, used furniture, some typical ones that you'll find in building materials and other uh, cleaning supplies are formaldehyde, you know, benzene can show up in some places. Places, anything you know, ending with ene, toluene, uh, xylene, and their whole classes of aldehydes and, and ketones, etc. That typical uh, sensors will pick up on. One of the ways you can detect VOCs is the new car smell. A lot of people are like, "Oh, it smells like a new car," but actually, that means you're being poisoned, essentially. I had a friend actually who uh, he had a connection at uh, some lab and uh, they did a sample of it and it turned out it was benzene in his car. So I don't know who's using benzene, but that's ridiculous. What's some of the health effects that those can cause? And then what are some ways to mitigate those health effects? Yeah, those effects can range anything from impacting your hormones, causing later issues in life, uh, you know, such as uh, tumors, uh, things like that. Uh, you can also uh, make you have kind of flu-like symptoms. Uh, you know, maybe you're always sort of sniffling and asthma-like symptoms. Things you can do, you know, cutting off some of those sources. You know, uh, if, if you're a building manager, not sourcing particular materials. If you're at home, you know, not using certain cleaning supplies, checking where your furniture's been uh, manufactured, letting it off gas uh, before bringing it in, uh, you know, letting those gases kind of get out. And uh, you know, certain things like uh, activated charcoal or, or carbon filters can have a little bit of an effect. Plants probably not going to do too much. Uh, they're nice to look at, but <laughs> they won't mitigate them. <laughs> You'd have to have like a forest inside your house, right? You know? Yeah, which, uh, you know, I'm not complaining. Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people understand that when you breathe, that that's how a lot of these air quality issues get in there. But that's not always the case with VOCs, right? I think there was a study done about how you can actually absorb it through your skin. VOCs um, can can have impacts on cognitive function. They, they also get in and mess with your hormones, you know, can lead to many other issues, whether you know, seemingly uh, innocuous uh, acne or or much you know worse problems, potentially tumor growth. So you know you always see those warning labels in uh, California buildings. So, you know uh, I think it's Prop 65 or um, right. you know that's it's typically indicating that like it is possible in in indoor spaces, especially through a lot of the building materials that we have. What what's a hazardous level of PM two point five? Usually, government agencies and World Health Organization as well will will recommend daily averages below twelve micrograms per meter cube. And if they say that there's a high level of PM two point five in the outdoor air, what's that levels like inside? Because I know a lot of people feel like, hey, if I close my windows, close my door, I'm safe. But that's not always the case. What's the difference between outdoor and indoor air quality when it comes to PM two point five? Yeah, we actually, we did a blog post on this uh, a few years ago during the bigger fire season. Outdoor was easily over 500 micrograms wow. per meter cube, which, you know, is, is like way in the purple for, for AQI. Even the indoors in some places was also maxed out. It was extremely like toxically high. So I, like a lot of people out there, have a gas stove. And recently I've learned how unhealthy they actually are. The EPA says that there's a 40% increased chance of kids having asthma when they have a gas stove. And I notice my VOCs and my PM 2.5 jumping off the charts on my aware when I do that. And so I would love to hear a little bit more about gas stoves if you had some information and, and what you recommend users do um, if they do have a gas stove and, and small children specifically. It's one of the bigger factors. I think even driving electrification, uh, you know, reducing those indoor contaminants that come from burning fossil fuels, uh, you know, when it's indoors with these tight little microcosms where everything's trapped in here, if you don't have good ventilation, again, that range hood, if it's not powerful enough, if you're not getting enough circulation or air changes per hour, then you need to maybe take a little more drastic measures, you know, such as putting a fan in a window and, and exhausting more of that air out. Because, yeah, as you said, you know, burning those fossil fuels, uh, you know, that natural gas, even though it's 
cleaner than maybe gasoline, it's still creating carbon dioxide, your, your socks and your NOx gases, and you know anything you can do to, again, ventilation, filtration, trying to cut off at the source too, you know, I'm not saying like dine out all the time, <laughs> but, uh, you know, there are certain cooking methods that can produce uh, fewer uh, gases and, and particulates, you know. Yeah, you made a good point there with electrification. And I know that there's actually a lot of the professional chefs, um, the stoves that are winning are induction stoves. And a lot of people are like, I like cooking with gas. That's why I have a gas stove. But there's actually better cooking services that heat quicker or more efficient. Um, and induction is, is a great example of that. And the other thing too is, is like you said, ventilation. Newer homes are built so tight. Sometimes when you flip on that stove vent, it actually can't pull in air. So you actually, your house is so tight, it can't pull out air. So it's really important to just crack a little window as you're cooking so that air can vent through and out. Our oven actually vents into the room so the, the temperature will go up, the CO2 will go up, everything. In Vegas, the reason they pump in oxygen is because CO2 oh, and yeah. oxygen and cold air, based on the temperature, you can control productivity. So, hey, like a, a lower temperature, you know, what are the effects of a lower temperature, higher temperature? And then the other thing is humidity. If it's really dry, like if it's below 40% humidity, my fingers start to crack. Or, hey, look, when I'm getting tired when I drive, I roll down the window and get blasted oh, with cold air. That's that's, that's a you know, great one. I mean, yeah, indoor uh, CO2 in a, in a car with the recirculation on, you'd be up over 3,500 PPM. Right. It's a microcosm. If you're in a car doing this, right? That yeah. same thing happens in buildings in building. too, yep. right? Why do you guys measure carbon dioxide? What's a good level of carbon dioxide? Tricky thing with carbon dioxide is that oftentimes you don't really notice it sneaking up on you. Probably one of those things that particularly in residences, people don't realize is high. Uh, you know, you, you probably get a similar, um, much more extreme effect in driving in your car on a long road trip. Uh, you may think, oh, I need to you know, stop and pull over and take a rest or something like, well, you, you may simply just need to open the window or, or um, you know, throw on some cold air and uh, get the outdoor air, you know, blowing in through the ventilation because it can get up to 3,500 or, or 4,000 PPM, which for some scale, uh, the typical outdoor levels uh slightly above 400 ppm uh, anything above a thousand you, you really start to feel kind of groggy and um can make you uh you know lose focus yeah it's uh it's the sleepy burrito without eating the burrito we've all had that <laughs> burrito at lunch that you start falling asleep you know um then we also talked about noise it actually has a profound effect on productivity, um, concentration levels. I know there's a number of studies in classrooms, whether you sit in the front, whether you sit in the back, and actually testing scores. Why does aware monitor noise, and what should we look out for in our own lives? Noise is a tricky one because there are all sorts of different kinds. There are those like you know frequent beepings from backing up trucks and and things like that to you know instantaneous you know one time noises, some drawer banging or something like that, and then continuous ongoing, more or less like annoying type things, or, or even the sort of drolling of a, of a fan. Everybody's got their own preference, but again, I, I think as you said, there are a lot of studies tying to, you know, certain levels and, and um, ambient noises that kind of like CO2, you may not quite realize it, but may just be like raising the stress levels uh, a little bit as, as your body's just sort of like, you know, attuned to it but like trying to block it out something that was annoying a month ago might just be leading to higher blood pressure now <laughs> what about humidity what's a good level what are some issues and what can people do about it yeah typically uh somewhere between 30 and 60 percent i believe is what asher recommends we usually are recommending 40 to 50 percent as higher ends you can start to get some uh, mold growth. And on the lower ends, you're really drying out your airways. And, uh, you know, it may not always be possible, though, like, especially in colder environments, it's uh, your skin will get cracked and dry, you know, it's not only a nuisance, but, uh, you know, it can make you more susceptible to catching stuff. So that's usually an early indicator. But you know, you don't want to go too high in the winter, again, that moisture accumulation on cold surfaces uh, can lead to, to mold. So it's really about finding the right balance, uh, depending on the season. Another thing that the aware sensors monitor is light. There are a lot of new studies on the importance of correct lighting. Yeah, on one side, there's uh, 
you know, concerns around circadian rhythm with all of our natural lighting and, and lighting in, during evening times and, you know, whether that's disrupting your, your body's like normal cycles of uh, sleep and awake. And then on the other side of things, uh, you know, depending on the tasks at hand, do you have the right uh, light level? Uh, so that's where we focus a little bit more, you know, do you have enough light in this space to be productive, you know, for maybe more task lighting at a, at a personal level or, you know, are those halogen bulbs just way too bright and overpowering in your space, you know, getting a little bit more closer to the outdoor brightness and getting natural uh, sunlight can help quite a bit uh, in, in both cases. It's just amazing how intertwined all of these different things are. What's a personal story that you can kind of use to relate with some of the, some of the listeners? Yeah, I, uh, we, we actually recently came out with a new feature on Omni where you can take it a little bit more mobile. It's nice for a little outing to like the beach or something and take it in the car and, and notice like uh, with the air conditioning on recirculation, I was shocked to find that the CO2 was up over 3,500 <laughs> ppm and that was just for you know a short drive right so co2 makes you sleepy there's a high level co2 in cars um it makes me want to uh, have automated cars sooner rather than later <laughs> yeah know, i mean I, I wonder if it leads to road rage or or any other issues you know people thinking clearly uh you know when they pull out into traffic and, and stuff like that you know it could be a factor of how well ventilated their car is what do you see as the responsibility of an organization or employer when it comes to indoor air quality or just sustainability in general i want to take the conversation away from who's paying that and stuff to who's benefiting improving the productivity of of your workforce if you're caring for them no matter where they're doing their work you know you could be on their commute too you know if you're care caring for them then you know they're going to to trust you more and be more loyal and and you're not going to have as much attrition sick days when you talk about triple bottom line two of those bottom lines they they really benefit the the company and and then uh, even with the environment the corporations are here for decades as opposed to individuals and this planet and and um you know everything is is here for them to keep striving in the future then yeah, everybody, you know, society wins. If you keep healthy people, then you get more profit on the long term, less churn. And even if people aren't spending a lot of time working at home, you know, we've talked with hospitals and they want to figure out ways to make sure that their doctors and their nurses are healthy at home. Because when they're healthy at home, they have less sick days and, and so on. Reminds me of that old myth, uh, you know, during the winter months when it's cold outside, that's how you catch the flu. It's like, no, actually, we're we're getting that in the indoors. And I wonder, you know, how much our bad indoor air quality practices, especially pathogens and things that are airborne. What can we do to prevent uh, retransmission and things indoors? Dean, we've reached the quick hitter section. A few questions we ask all of our guests. So what gets you up in the morning? Ooh, uh, making a difference. What's your favorite breakfast beverage? Coffee. Need that Your coffee, coffee person right in the morning. Yeah. Are there any books you'd recommend about indoor air quality? I love Dr. Joe Allen's uh, Healthy Buildings. It's kind of been my Bible since I, I read it. A lot of interesting points in there. I mean, I go back and find new little tidbits that I didn't pick up on, you know, first time reading through. That's a, that's a great book. What's one tip that you would give anybody listening to this podcast when it comes to improving the air quality? Maybe instead of using harsh chemicals, you know, clean surfaces and things, uh, especially during the, that became really popular during the pandemic, but it's probably not as important as uh, initially thought. But, you know, maybe uh, using water or a little less um, caustic uh, materials and um, even reusable rags if you can. Well, thanks again, Dean. Um, yep. Really, really glad we had you on this podcast. And, you know, I, we're excited as EarthUp's excited to continue to work with AWARE to really educate businesses and uh, residents on how to improve air quality. Yeah, thanks, Stephen. And that's our episode. If you'd like more info about what Dean is doing at AWARE, visit getaware.com. And EarthUp is excited to partner with AWARE to offer a 20% discount inside our platform, which you'll be able to access when we launch in late April 2021. Thank you so much for listening in and for your support. If you like our show, hit that subscribe button, tell a friend, share with a colleague, and rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts. Your support helps us reach a wider audience, so thank you. 
To learn more about EarthUp and our journey to launching our new platform that's helping companies and communities simplify sustainability, visit earthup.eco and follow EarthUp on LinkedIn.